All right. So tonight, as Eric mentioned, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and then also talk about a few specific terms, particularly salvation, and then some of the terms related to salvation that Scripture teaches us and that, and that God reveals to us about salvation. So the first thing is the Holy Spirit. So we're going to start with the Holy Spirit and talking about the third, <clears throat> the third person of the Trinity. So if you remember, so in the Trinity, the Trinity is the belief and understanding It's what God has revealed about Himself. So the Trinity, God tells us that He is one God and three divine persons. And so oftentimes this is represented with a triangle in a sense, just to give us an image of this. So you have God... And then there's three divine persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And tonight isn't so much a talk about the Trinity itself and understanding this great mystery, but it's focusing on the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Now this is definitely a mystery, this understanding of the Trinity and how it's possible there's one God, yet three divine persons, but it's been revealed to us, and there are some things we can know through Revelation. So with the Holy Spirit, just like the Son and the Father, the Holy Spirit is God, all three of the different persons are one, so there's a union there, but they're also distinct. And so the terminology the church uses is that they're not separate They're just distinct because they're not complete. You can't separate them. Everything that the Father and the Son do, the Holy Spirit also participates in. So they're all united. There's a communion there that's inseparable, but they're distinct persons. Just like God the Father is eternal, there's no beginning, no end, so is God the the Son and God the Holy Spirit. All of three are eternal, so there's no beginning, no end. All three are unchangeable. All three are infinite. All three love us unconditionally and infinitely. Oftentimes you'll hear some descriptions, some characteristics given about the three persons. So oftentimes we may say, God the Father is creator. God the Son is redeemer. God the Holy Spirit is sanctifier. Now when we hear these characteristics, this is more for us. This isn't the exact reality because God the Father is not the only person that was involved in creation. All three were involved in creation. So even though God the Father is called Creator, all three were involved in creation. All three were there at the beginning participating in the creation of everything, creating everything from nothing. So God the Holy Spirit is also Creator. God the Son is also Creator. Now God the Holy Spirit is given the term sanctifier. Sanctification, sanctifier, it means to make holy. So this idea of making holy. Now the church and scripture often refers to the Holy Spirit as the sanctifier, but all three are involved in making us holy. All three, whenever they give us the ability to partake in the divine nature, we're all, all three are involved in sanctification. So God the Holy Spirit is called the sanctifier, but all three participate in that. It's more for, again, us, because our finite human mind is limited. It's hard for us to grasp the reality of the Trinity. So there's this emphasis on these different characteristics to help us kind of reiterate that they're distinct. There's three distinct persons. Now, having said that, the one exception is this idea of God the Son being the Redeemer. God the Son is called the Redeemer, but it's God the Son alone who can be called Redeemer. God the Holy Spirit and God the Father will not be given that description because they did not become man. Only God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, became man, became incarnate, which means became man. So God, Jesus Christ was true God and true man. And as true God and true man, He was on this earth, walked and talked... For, preached for three years with his apostles, and then ultimately died on the cross for us. And when he died on the cross, that was redemption. And we'll talk about that more later, but only God the Son became incarnate, became man. So only God the Son can be called the Redeemer. But another description you may hear with God the Son is wisdom. All three 
all three participate in this term wisdom along with the Son. So God the Son can be defined as wisdom, but so can God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. It's just this one term Redeemer that's uniquely given to God the Son. And so, just like God the Father is perfect and good and truth and beauty, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are perfect, they're good, true, beautiful, um, the ultimate perfection. Each one carries all those different attributes of the divine nature perfectly and holds them perfectly. So God, God the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. In Scripture, we're going to see other different descriptions to help us better understand God the Holy Spirit and this third person. So in Scripture, we're going to see a few occasions, particularly in the New Testament, where it's clearly shown that there's God the Holy Spirit who is distinct from God the Father and God the Son. One example is at the Incarnation itself. So at the Annunciation, when Gabriel comes to Mary, in the beginning of Luke's Gospel, the Gabriel, Gabriel will come to Mary and talk to her and announce to her the news that Jesus is going to, that she's going to bear a child named Jesus. And so whenever the angel tells her that this is going to take place, he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and then you'll conceive a child, and his name will be Jesus. So we're shown that the Holy Spirit is this distinct reality, this distinct person of the Trinity. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would come upon Mary and overshadow her, and then she would conceive the second person of the Trinity who had become man, who had become incarnate. So we can see there's some distinctness between those persons in that episode, in that event. And then an even more clear picture is whenever Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. So when Jesus is baptized in the Jordan, we see very clearly that there are three distinct persons in the Trinity. So we have Jesus in the Jordan River with John the Baptist, and we're told that he goes under the water, and when he comes out, then you hear God the Father's voice say, Behold my Son. And then it says a dove came upon him, and so that's to represent the Holy Spirit. So we have God the Son, Jesus Christ, incarnate, and then you have God the Father, who is represented by that voice, and then God the Holy Spirit represented by the dove. And so those three divine persons in communion with each other in that event is shown. So there's a lot of other examples. It's the scripture will kind of show this to us to show this re- this reality to us so that it can continue to show us this is what God has revealed. This is the truth. Even though it's hard for our minds to grasp fully, we know that it is what God has revealed and so we know that it is true. The other thing scripture will do to help us learn more about uh, God the Holy Spirit is to show us um, some different symbols, some different images that will represent the Holy Spirit and some of the work that He does along with God the Father and God the Son. So we'll see images of water, oil, fire, and a dove, just to name a few of them. So with water, why would this be a good and appropriate symbol for the Holy Spirit and some of the work that we're told that the Holy Spirit, along with God the Father and God the Son, does. So what does water do? Why is that a good image for the Holy Spirit? Okay, so washing or cleansing. In red. So I'll just say washing, cleansing. What else? What else does water do? Extinguishes thirst. Okay. So, I'll just put thirst here, but yeah, quenches thirst, extinguishes your thirst. What else? What else does water in our own natural world symbolize when we think about water? Flood? Oh, life? Life. So it gives new birth. Good one. Okay, what else? Good or bad. Sometimes water can be associated with things not so good. So new birth and life, what would you say? Flood. Yeah, the flood. Okay. So what does the flood do? What does a flood do when water comes and washes away in such large numbers in the, like as a flood? What does it do? It destroys. It destroys, what would you say? Okay, so there's like this destruction and then it'll, coming from that oftentimes is some type of new birth. Um, what I kind of think about a term would be like transforming. So it's going to destroy, but also bring to new, bring new life potentially. I mean, if it washes away what exists, new birth, new life will often come. So we'll just say transforms. Um, 
We can also think even in, in Scripture how you have the flood with Noah and what it's doing is transforming the world because it's trying to get rid of the evil, evil and the wickedness to transform it, to try to start over with Noah and his family with the goodness that they have. So there's transforming. Um, so that's a good start. So with the Holy Spirit, it's often associated with water. So you can think about in baptism. Baptism is associated with water to remind us that in that sacrament... We are, give, we are washed, we are cleansed, we're purified from our sins. So all of our sins are washed away, we're cleansed, we're made new, we're made a new creature, and cre- new creation in Christ. We're transformed from, from the inside out, we are transformed through baptism. So that water and the Holy Spirit comes upon us in that sacrament to transform us and change us. And so water's a good image that goes along with that. Now with the sacraments, as y'all have talked about some and probably will continue to talk about throughout the year, we know that whenever Jesus gives us the sacraments, it's, it's called efficacious, means it is going to do what Jesus promises it will do. So when Jesus gives us baptism and says it will wash away your sins, then it will. That grace we're given will cleanse us and purify us and transform us. Not just outwardly, interiorly. From the inside out, it will perfectly transform us. So water does that. What about fire? Let's move on to fire. What is, or actually oil, skip the oil. Let's do oil. What are in this in the in our own natural world? What are some things that oil kind of symbolizes or represents that would be associated with the Holy Spirit? Healing. Anointing. What'd you say? Healing. healing. So healing and anointing. Good healing. Anointing. Anything else? Light. Light. Okay. Anything else? Power. power. Is that what you said? Yeah. So power, and sometimes people will even say like strength. So, and that's a good one. The A lot of times back in the old days, the athletes would put oil all over their body because this idea of strengthening them. Um, so strengthening. So strengthening, power, healing, anointing. Um, sometimes the oil is also associated with a good smell. So there's this just beautiful aroma. And in the scripture it tells us we want to be like the aroma of Christ. So that oil kind of reminds us of that. So those, those are a good start with oil. And so you can see why that's associated with the Holy Spirit. Because this is some of the things the Holy Spirit will work in us, particularly through the sacraments. And with oil you can think of confirmation and anointing of the sick. Um, holy orders. I think there's oil there. Maybe not. Um, is there oil in the holy orders? I think there is, yeah. Um, yeah, on the hands. Mm-hmm. So you have all these things represented in these sacraments um, with that. So what about fire? Fire can be cleansing, too. Mm-hmm. can be. Cleansing. Absolutely. And even a more powerful term besides cleansing might be what? Sterilize. Okay, what else? Think about like if you are taking metal and putting it in fire, what does it do to that metal? Purifying. Purifying. Mm-hmm. So it'll make, um, like if you have silver or gold, it's going to purify it. Um, and that's this idea of fire will purify us. Um, purgatorial fires and some of the, just this idea of the sacraments purifying us. So what else? Anything else with fire? You can also kind of say transforms with this one as well. So purifies, transforms, cleanses. What about the dove? There's one primary image. Okay. Good. Anything else? Uh Uh-huh. So purity and peace. Those are probably the two big ones. Um, so, and the peace is this idea. Uh, scripture, when it talks about peace, it's often it's not talking about a matter of there being war or no war, like physical war. It's talking about this inner peace where there's no there's no longer a sense of I'm searching, searching, searching for my happiness. I found it in God. There's this inner peace where I know that God is the fulfillment of all that I desire, the fulfillment of all my happiness. So there's this sense of peace through that. In that sense, um, the scripture often talks about whenever it talks to us about searching for peace. But the dove will symbolize those things. And then there's, there's more, but these are probably the big four um, that Scripture will use these images to bring these ideas to our mind. And particularly when it's talking about the Holy Spirit and the work that the Holy Spirit does along with God the Father and God the Son. Now we're also told in the New Testament that because of what Jesus did on the cross, the Holy Spirit was a gift 
that was made available to each one of us because of that. So the Holy Spirit, along with what's called grace, um, are made available. So because Jesus died on the cross... He redeemed all men, and He forgives the sins of all men. And we're going to come back to define those words here in just a second. But when He died on the cross, He made the Holy Spirit available to each one of us with that grace as a gift. So if we're open to receiving this gift, that the Holy Spirit will come in, into our soul and be infused within us, that Holy Spirit with that grace. And we can see this in Scripture, actually. And the first place that we're going to receive the Holy Spirit and grace is at baptism. And so we believe in the sacrament of baptism. Scripture, we believe God has revealed to us that baptism gives us grace and gives us the Holy Spirit. And then at confirmation, that is strengthened. So if you want to look in your Bibles to Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And then also put your finger on Acts chapter 2. So Acts 22 and Acts 2. We'll do 22 first. So Acts 22 and Acts 2, this is right after the four Gospels. Now if you look in Acts 22, so verses 16, verse 16. And this is going to be um, with Paul, who he's had his conversion. And so he's going to be baptized because Ananias is going to come to him and he's going to baptize him. But Paul is there. So verse 16 is very important because it tells us a little bit more about baptism. So Paul converts. Ananias prays over him and gives him. He, he, Paul had been blinded and now he receives his sight again. And so then in verse 16, it says, And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Okay, so that's a key passage because baptism, washing away the sins. Very clear in Scripture that that's what God intends baptism to do. Okay, so washing away your sins in baptism. And, and as he's encouraging Paul, why do you wait? Let's be baptized to wash away your sins. And then in Acts chapter 2, it'll tell us even a little bit more. So Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. So Acts chapter 2 towards the beginning of that book, 37 and 38. This is going to be Peter's first sermon. Mm -hmm. And so what is Peter going to say to the people? It's very important. He's going to tell them, um, it says, Now when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were really affected by what Peter had said. And so in verse 38, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins... And what does he say? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So in baptism, we're going to receive the Holy Spirit and our sins will be forgiven. And we're going to talk about um, that briefly but here in just a second. But our, all of our sins will be forgiven through baptism. So it's the first time we can receive the Holy Spirit and that gift that Christ has made available to us through His death. Now you don't have to turn to this one, but in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 6... St. Paul is even going to tell us a little bit more as well because in this passage he's going to tell us, he's going to be telling Titus and the people that they once had been foolish and blind. They had been slaves to their passions, but now they're changed. And it says, "For we once, For we ourselves were once foolish and disobedient. We were led astray. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of anything we had done, but by the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit, which He poured out upon us through Jesus Christ. So again, this washing of renewal, washing of regeneration, and the Holy Spirit coming upon us. So this idea of baptism and the Holy Spirit being tied together is the moment we receive the Holy Spirit and this great gift that Jesus made available to us. Now, at our baptism, we receive the Holy Spirit and grace, and it's strengthened at confirmation. And one of the things we also receive are something that are called the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let's see. So we're going to do the gifts of the Holy Spirit first. So the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Anyone know the gifts by chance? You can shout them out if you do. Any, it's going to be seven. Seven gifts. So wisdom. Okay. Wisdom, yep, right. Okay, good. 
So wisdom and understanding, um, counsel, also knowledge. These four in a group, and there's three more. Uh huh. So prudence. Actually, prudence is. Prudence won't be it. No. Uh, courage, like fortitude. Yeah, sorry. Piety. And then fear of the Lord. So prudence is going to be a, car, uh, a cardinal virtue. Um, so cardinal virtue, a little different. But these are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they're fear of the Lord. So what these, what these are... We're given them at baptism of strength and at confirmation. And the first four help our intellect, help our mind, our reason. The last three help our will. So wisdom is the truth that God reveals. So that wisdom, the truth that God reveals, is included in this idea of wisdom. So with wisdom, we'll receive the truths of God, some revelations of God. Understanding allows us to better grasp those truths. Knowledge allows us to use these truths to make good decisions. And then the counsel um, is what helps us to apply these. We're able to judge actions to be right and wrong. So you have wisdom, which are the truths that God wants us to know. We're not going to be given every single thing and know know truth like God knows truth. But that wisdom is this truth, these revelations God has given us. And then understanding is grasping those things better than we would without these gifts. Counsel is using these things to make good decisions, and knowledge is using these things as well to help inform um, our choices. Um, And then fortitude, courage, that strengthens our will, especially during times of struggle or in times when we're fearing or afraid. Piety strengthens our will to desire to love and serve God. So piety is going to strengthen us so that we will desire to love God more and to do God's will. And then fear of the Lord strengthens our will so that it won't won't offend God. So those three things want to help our will. Courage to persevere. Courage to stay strong. Courage to always do God's will. Piety, is, piety and fear of the Lord are going to help our will continue to love and serve God and keep His will the highest priority. Not my will, but God's will be done. And so these gifts, we possess them because we're filled with the Holy Spirit. So we have those gifts within us. And we can continually strengthen them through the sacraments and through prayer and through our cooperation. So we can continue to grow in these throughout our lives and make these gifts become stronger and more evident in our life. Now, another thing that the whole, we get with the Holy Spirit or, that comes along with having the Holy Spirit are called the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now, the fruits are this idea that if we're living and cooperating with that Holy Spirit in our soul, our life will have fruits as evidence of that. And so these gifts we're given will help us to do God's will and to know God's will. And then as we continue to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and with that grace within us, our lives will be filled with fruits that will be evident of this. Just like the idea of a tree. So a tree, you know that it's healthy and growing whenever it has it produces fruits. So same with our own soul. Some of these fruits are going to be joy. And joy is one of those things where even in the midst of suffering and pain, you may still be hurting and you may still be um, sad about it, but you're going to still be joyful because you know God loves you and you know that God is never going to give you anything you can't handle. So you'll still have this joy within you. You'll be, have kindness and goodness, generosity, gentleness, patience, which this idea of persevering and suffering, um, faithfulness, self-control, chastity, And then charity. And charity is this idea of putting the love of God and the love of neighbor above all things. So everything that you do is for the love of God. And then you love neighbor because of your love of God, for the sake of God. And so, like we know, an apple tree is an apple tree because it produces apples. So you'll know a Christian, you'll know someone who has that Holy Spirit in in their soul because you're going to see these things in their life. So one of the other things, so we're all filled with the Holy Spirit at our baptism. We're given that grace. We're given these gifts. And you'll see the more and more we cooperate, the more we'll have the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But not only each one of us individually, the church herself was given the Holy Spirit. And we can see this throughout Scripture. But what Jesus does is He comes to earth, um, becomes incarnate, 
And during those three years of his ministry, he gathers men around him, particularly 12 men. The 12 men are the apostles. And Jesus is going to teach them all things. At the, towards the end of Jesus' life, as he's approaching his Paschal mystery and he knows he's going to have to suffer and die in Jerusalem, he tells the apostles um, in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, he tells them that after I'm gone, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be an advocate. And so that means he's going to be someone who's with them. Um, and so he's going to be an advocate, he's going to be a counselor, he will be with you, and he will remind you of everything I've taught you, and he will reveal to all truths to you. And he made that promise to those 12 men. And so to those 12 men, when they received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, they were going to be filled with this gift that he gave them. And then Jesus also tells us in Matthew 16, 18, that the gates of hell will never never prevail against his church. And so that's this other promise that God and Christ has this protection, the Holy Spirit will have this protection, that the church will never be able to be defiled or never will fall into error or never, never, never will fall into the hands of Satan and the devil. So the church will be protected and this protection is going to come from the Holy Spirit that's given to her. And so the Holy Spirit will always be with the church, guiding her, um, guiding her and her members. Now, it doesn't mean that her members won't make mistakes. It doesn't mean that the members of the church are, are going to be sinless. We're all humans. We're all going to sin. So all the priests and the bishops, even the Pope, I mean, they're sinners. And we know that. But because of the church herself being protected, when the church makes certain decisions and um, guides us, the Holy Spirit will be there to protect us. So anytime the church, which means the Pope or the Pope in union with the bishops, makes a decision on matters of faith and on matters of morals that is is infallible, means it cannot err. It's because the Holy Spirit is protecting that and guiding that. You can also even see this just in the Scripture itself. So sometimes we wonder, well, how how can this happen? How can God protect an institution or a hierarchy, as some people call it? Look at the Bible. We know the Bible is the inspired Word of God. It's without error because God chose certain men... And he, he used these men to help give us the Bible. So God co-authored with these men. God and these men together wrote the words of these pages so that we could have revelations from God. And so God is working through men to bring these great truths to us. Just like with the church, God works through men who are the, the leaders of the church to guide us, to give us his truths, to give us the, revel, the revelations he wants us to know. And so the Holy Spirit is that promise, that protection, that God will never let His church fall into error. It will never fall, the church will always be here until the end of time. No matter, no matter how big or small, there always will be Christ's church because the Holy Spirit will always be protecting it. <clears throat> and so the church is filled with the Holy Spirit and given that promise just like each of her members. And the Holy Spirit keeps the church pure and holy and spotless because Christ has a spotless bride. And Christ's bride is the church. And so that church will be pure and and it'll be perfect and spotless and holy. Um, And again, that doesn't necessarily mean her individual members, but the church as a whole. The church as the body of Christ. And so the Holy Spirit fills each one of us and fills the church. We're each given these gifts. We need to continue to help them grow and strengthen them in our lives so that we can let the Holy Spirit be working through us so we can produce those great fruits in our life. The other thing the Holy Spirit does is it it gives us that grace, infuses us with grace, and that grace is very important because it's grace that enables us to be able to get to heaven. So if we're filled with this sanctifying grace, we can get to heaven. And so that's going to lead us into the next portion of this, is is salvation. So how do we get to heaven? And so I think in previous classes you've talked about in the beginning and how man was created and what God did in the beginning. And so in the beginning, you have Adam and Eve who are created. And when God creates them, He creates them good. Um, just as a refresher, we'll just draw it really quick. And so you have, you have Adam and Eve. They're created good. And God loves them. He has an infinite love for them. He says, you're good. So they're human nature. They're created with their human nature, and it's good. Christ gives them gifts. He gives them a lot of different types of gifts. The main one we're going to talk about and focus on is grace. Because grace is going to enable them to be united with God and in communion with Him. So they're given sanctifying grace. Now they were tempted in, in, in the desert, or in the desert, they were tempted by the devil in the garden. 
And whenever they fell into sin, they lost trust in God. They said, well, this devil, I mean, he's, kind of con- he's pretty convincing. He's telling us that God's actually being this tyrant. He doesn't want us to have all things that are good. He's telling us to stay away from this tree because he's keeping something from us. Even though that was a lie that Satan was giving them, they still fell into that temptation. So they lost trust in God. They lost that faith in God. They lost their... They, they didn't trust that love God had promised that he had for them. So they reject God and his love. And because of that, they lose the gift. They lose all the gifts he had given them. And so they lose that grace. Now they still stay human. And so they still have that human nature. But they're just now left to their own natural powers. They don't have this supernatural power anymore that's going to help them get to heaven. So that they lost grace. <clears throat> and so because of that, all generations that come from them, every single human... Um, All their children, up until today, they're born without grace. And so we kind of refer to that as being born with original sin. So they're born without grace. They're born with this tendency to sin. We tend to give in to our emotions and our passions rather than really listening to our reason. We don't have good control of our will. And so, so these are some of the things that we're born into this world with, is the original sin. So without grace, with this tendency to sin, this tendency to want to choose things that aren't always leading us towards God. And so because of that, <clears throat> it left us not being able to get to heaven. But God didn't abandon us. He didn't leave us at that situ- with that situation. In Genesis 3.15, um, He talks about how He's going to promise to send a Savior. And so what's going to happen is over time, in the New Testament we'll see, Paul tells us that in the fullness of time, God sent His only Son, Jesus, to be our Savior, to redeem us. And so Jesus dies on the cross. As we talked about in previous classes, Jesus dies on the cross. And he has to do that. It's a sacrifice that he has to make because of sin. And he dies for the sins of all humanity. All sin that ever had been committed or ever will commit, Jesus dies for that. And this is what's called the redemption. And so redemption is this idea of buying back in the sense of Jesus pays for the sins that we had committed that made us lose the possibility of heaven. So until Jesus died on the cross, heaven wasn't possible to men. So Jesus had to die so that He could restore that relationship so that heaven was now possible again. So you have the the redemption. Jesus redeems all men. The sins of all men are forgiven. And then grace is now offered to everyone. So because of this, grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit... It's offered to every single human person. Now we have the free will still to choose to cooperate with it and accept it and receive it, or the the free will to reject it. But if we receive it and cooperate with it, we can be filled with that grace, and we can be enabled once again to get to heaven. And so this grace and the Holy Spirit is what man needs to be able to get to heaven. So man needs that grace because our human nature with its own natural powers cannot get to heaven. We have to have this supernatural power to elevate us, to perfect us, to get us to heaven. We have to have that grace. So Jesus makes it available to everyone so that we all have that possibility once again to get to heaven. And as I mentioned, baptism is our first, at that first time, that initial time we receive that grace in the Holy Spirit. Baptism will forgive all sins. Original sin and any personal sin, which are sins we commit in our own lives, it'll it'll forgive all those sins, and then it'll give us grace so we can be enabled to get to heaven. This is how come the Catholic Church talks about um, salvation, and salvation being a process. So what do we mean? So heaven, heaven, to be in heaven, this is final salvation. So final salvation... is us being in heaven. So we want to be in heaven. That's our goal. So throughout our life, we're aiming for heaven. So throughout our life, we're trying to continue to receive grace into our soul to be able to get to heaven. And if we persevere, and if we die with grace in our soul, and some people will use the word in a state of grace, so if we die with grace in our soul, we have that supernatural power so we can be in heaven with God. But, for, but throughout our life, we call salvation a process. Because we never know what may happen tomorrow. We may have grace in our soul now, 
but then tomorrow we may fall into mortal sin and commit a sin that causes us to lose that grace. And mortal sin is a serious, grave sin that we commit freely. We choose it. We know it's serious, and we do it anyway. So if you commit mortal sin, you can lose that grace. And now your relationship with God is now that it's completely broken. You no longer have that grace that makes you be able to be united to God. And so we have God and man. And so before Jesus, we really didn't have, we weren't united because we didn't have that redemption. But once the redemption came, man was united. Man had the possibility to be united to God. So through baptism, we receive grace. We're united to God. If we commit a venial sin, which is a smaller sin, it's still serious. You don't want to ignore them, but they're, but they're smaller sins. We still have a relationship, but it is wounded. It's affected, but we still have grace. We still have grace in our soul. If we commit a mortal sin, though, that cuts us off. We no longer have a relationship with God because we're totally rejecting Him. We're telling Him, I know how you want me to live, but I'm not going to live that way. I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to um, you know, break some of your Ten Commandments. I'm, I'm going to live life how I want. I'm going to do my will, not yours. So you commit a mortal sin, you're without grace. So that's how come the church says we can lose our salvation. Because if someone dies in a state of mortal sin where they're not having grace, then whether or not they get to heaven, it's in question. We leave it to God's mercy, but... We don't know what's going to happen. Mortal sin will keep you out of heaven. Only God knows our hearts, so we can't say, oh, that person's going to hell. But definitely their salvation is in jeopardy if you are in a state of mortal sin. Because you cannot get to heaven in a state, if you die in a state of mortal sin. If you die without grace in your soul, you cannot get to heaven. And so salvation is a process. Every single day, we're striving to fill our soul with grace. And as soon as we may commit an act that is mortal, a mortal sin. We want to confess it immediately in the sacrament of confession, which you'll talk about at some point. But that will restore that grace. That will, once again, restore that grace in our souls that we're once again united to God and enabled to have that supernatural power that will help us get to heaven. So as Catholics, we can say, with salvation, I have been saved, I'm being saved, and I hope to be saved, or I will be saved. Because those are the words of Scripture. Scripture uses those same words, present tense, past tense, past tense, and future tense, when it talks about salvation. Because it is something that's a process. Because we just never know. Every single day we want to convert and, and draw deeper and deeper um, into our relationship with God. We never know what may happen. Because we, God never takes away that free will. Even grace within our soul doesn't take away that free will to choose one day to reject God. And so we say salvation is, is a process. They, you may also hear the term justification and sanctification. And these are related to salvation. So salvation is being in heaven. Justification and sanctification. So justification means being made pleasing to God. Or being made righteous, as some people may say. And so some people say it's like a state of going from being unrighteous to being righteous. Going from being in a state where you're not pleasing to God, you're not in a right relationship with God, to being now in a right relationship with God, being pleasing. And so justification is that moment that, that we are transformed. Now that happens at baptism initially. But again, justification is a process throughout our life. And Scripture uses past tense and future tense in Scripture about justification because we can lose that as well. Just like as I mentioned with salvation, if we commit a mortal sin, we can lose that righteousness. We can go from being righteous to once again being unrighteous and not pleasing to God. In Scripture, in Matthew 5, chapter, chapter 5, verse 48, and in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, it tells us this. It says, The pure of heart will see God. That's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. And then in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In Revelation 21, 27, Nothing unclean will enter heaven. So we have to be perfect and holy and pure to enter heaven, to be in the presence of God. So we must be justified, meaning being in a right relationship with God, being pleasing to God. And then we must also be sanctified, which means to be made holy. We must have these things in our soul to enter heaven. We must be justified and we must be sanctified. But we know this is all a process. They're all tied together. So salvation being in heaven 
is tied together with these other terms because in order to be saved, to be in heaven, we must be in a right relationship with God, we must be righteous, and we must also be holy. So again, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Revelation 21, verse 27. You must be clean and pure and perfect and holy to be able to enter, to he- enter heaven. So we, this earthly life, all these things are in a process. Every single day, as we cooperate with grace, we're being transformed. We're being made perfect. We're being made pure throughout our earthly life. And so we can see that all these things are pr- a process. And they're all intimately tied together. And we believe that when God says that I'm going to make you holy, that He means what He says. You can think about in Genesis when God said, let there be light. What happened? There was light. So if God says, I'm going to transform you, I'm going to make you pure and perfect, He will do that. And so we have this earthly life to do that. It's a process. And so in order to enter heaven, we must be perfect and pure. Now, as I mentioned, Christ's suffering and death on the cross redeemed all men. So all men, that relationship with God was restored, and all men, heaven was now possible for all men. We just have to make those choices to cooperate with grace or not. So the possibility of salvation is offered to all. But we know not all men are saved because Jesus tells us there are some people who will be in hell. Some people will be separated from God. So we know that not everyone is going to make that choice to cooperate with grace, even though it's available to him. But those who do cooperate with God's grace, they're going to be transformed. And that's going to lead us to another component of what salvation means. Okay, so grace. We're not going to read all of these together. I'm gonna, we're going to pick one to read, but I'm going to just put them up here real quick. Some Bible verses that you can refer to about grace. Second Corinthians 12.9 is where I want you to... Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 12.9. I'm going to just read the other ones to you. But um, while you're looking for 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, you can look for that one. But in John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus says, Apart from me you can do nothing. One of the things he's referring to is grace. Apart from grace, with our natural powers alone, we can do nothing that's going to be salvific. Nothing that can help us get to heaven can be done with our natural power. We need grace. So apart from me, you can do nothing. So apart from Jesus' grace, we cannot be saved. In Romans 8, verse 28, And everything God works for good with those who love Him. So God works within us if we love Him, if we choose to cooperate with grace. Um, we'll skip to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. So God is able to make grace abound to you so that you will have all you need in every good work. So grace, again, is going to work in us to enable us to do good works that, help, that, that are salvific. But 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. So this one's really a beautiful passage that Paul um, writes to the Corinthians. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Paul says, um, he's talking about different things to the Corinthians about his own experiences and his visions and revelations, but he's going to say in, in verse 9, but he said to me, talking about Jesus, but Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And, this, and then Paul goes on to say, I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so what he's saying is this grace within him, it's sufficient. And what it's going to do is this is the power of God transforming Paul. Within his own weaknesses, he's transforming those. And it says, my power is made perfect in weakness. God's power is made perfect in our own weaknesses. God will use our weaknesses and elevate our nature, elevate us so that we can have the supernatural power within us to do what God calls us to do. And so this power of God is made perfect within us, within our own souls. This grace is God's power within us. So it's making our own weaknesses perfect. It's going to purify us and make us perfect. And so with grace, if we cooperate with grace, we're going to be able to have faith and do good works. 
That's what's going to be one of the, the fruits of us cooperating with grace is faith and good works. And this is one of the things that Paul is talking about, that my weaknesses on my own, with my own natural powers, I'm not able to have or have faith or do good works that are going to help me get to heaven. I have to have grace. And so the church says that we are saved by grace. And when we cooperate with that grace, we'll be able to have faith in Christ and do good works and be able to have that power to enable us to get to heaven. One of the analogies that I like to think about when it, we're thinking about how grace works in our soul is so I I'm an, pretend I'm an artist. I'm not an artist, but pretend. And here's my little marker that I'm going to draw beautiful things with. Okay, so here's my beautiful picture. So I've drawn this circle. So you have the artist, the pen, and the circle. So who did the work of making that circle? The artist, the, artist, the pen... Like the artist, the marker. Right. So who did the work? So what percent did, did I do? What percent did I do the work? Did I do a hundred percent of the work? Fifty percent of the work? How did I make that circle? What? I know. So who? Like if you have the marker and you have me, and you want to say what percent of each made that circle? So fifty percent me, fifty percent the marker. Any other ideas? 80-20? You want to not do it with a third. It took the board, it took the board, it okay. took the third. Okay. It took all three, it took the board also. Okay, well, this is the idea of grace. So you have the human, which you can say that the, you can say the artist is man, the pen is grace. So how did I do, how did I do that work, that circle? Could I have done it without the pen? No. no. Could the pen have done it without me? No. So it's 100% me and 100% the marker. Okay? So you have to have both. So uh, this analogy with grace, you have to have grace. We can't do salvific works, good works. We can't have faith in Christ without grace. So if, if man on his own without grace, they can't do anything that's going to help them get to heaven. So just like grace is 100% grace, it's also us too. We have to cooperate with that. So just like drawing that circle was 100% me, 100% the marker. That's the, kind of the, the church's understanding of grace and how it works within us. We have to have it. We have to cooperate with it in order to have faith and do good works. And so with that grace, we can reject it. We can say, I don't, I don't want to cooperate. I'm just going to do things on my own. I can still, even if I don't cooperate with grace, if I don't believe in God, unless I'm an atheist, I could still be nice to my neighbor. I could still do good things. It's just there's not going to be anything that's going to help me get to heaven because I don't have that supernatural power within me to help those, to elevate those works, to elevate me to have that supernatural power. And I'm not saying, I'm not judging an atheist. I have no idea what their hearts are. God will look at their hearts and know what they should know. But, but if you have to have that grace. So in order to do salvific good works, if you want to call them that, good works that are because you love God, you need that grace. Same with faith. You have to have this grace to have this particular type of faith that's going to help you get to heaven. So in James chapter 2, he talks about how with faith without works is dead. Just like a body without a soul is dead. So if I die, my soul will be separated from my body. My body is now dead. It's not living. It's not alive because it does not have my soul. Same with faith without works. They have to go together because if I have faith in Christ but I'm not doing good things, I'm living a bad life, then I really don't have faith. I'm not really cooperating with grace. Same with my good works. If I don't believe in God and believe in Christ, I'm not having grace. You have to have faith and good works together. Just like St. James says. And St. James in his letter will also say that the, the demons believe, but they shudder. So the demons have a faith, but it's not this saving faith. It's not this faith that's cooperating with grace at all. They believe in God. They believe Jesus exists. They know He exists. They know God exists. But the demons have a different type of faith. They don't have this salvific faith because they're not working with grace. So what does Scripture tell us? This is kind of going along with, so you have grace... And so grace is how we're saved. We are saved by grace. And that grace is made, made available to us by, by Christ. Jesus Christ makes grace available. That's how we're saved. But if we cooperate with grace, we're also going to have faith in good works. Okay? And so scripture tells us this very clearly. It tells us how, how is it that we enter heaven. 
In Matthew chapter 9, I'm not going to have you look at these, we'll just run through them real quick. But Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, a man comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, what good work must I do to get eternal life? So in order to enter heaven, Jesus says, if you want to enter life, obey the commandments. So there is this concept of you have, there are things you need to do. It's not just having a belief or having a faith and then living live life however you want. You must obey the commandments. In Romans chapter 2, verse 8, Paul says that it's to those who persist in doing good. That's who Christ will give eternal life to. In Matthew 7, verses 21, not, not Jesus, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me on the last day, Lord, Lord, in this idea of I know you, you're Jesus, you're Lord, Lord, Lord. He says, not everyone who says Lord, Lord will enter heaven. It's only those who do the will of my Father. And so he's telling them it's not just a matter of believing in me. It's a matter of cooperating with grace. Because if you do that, you'll have faith and good works. And so we need both faith and good works to enter heaven. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this is that beautiful um, passage that's about love and that's often read at weddings. But if I were to tell you that I have faith that is so strong I can move mountains, I, I, have, faith that, I have faith in God, faith in Jesus... My faith is so strong to move mountains. Is that all I need to be saved? No. What if I die? I'm a die a martyr, and I die, and I'm killed because of my faith. Is that enough? We would kind of think maybe, but but it, but Paul says no. Paul says in First Corinthians chapter thirteen, verses one to three: If I have faith so as to move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. He even will say, if you die but you don't have love. If you die for your faith, but you don't have love, it's nothing. You have to have that love, and that love is this idea of cooperating with grace, having, having, your, having your soul always directed towards God. And so in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, Paul will say it's faith working through love. Faith and love, always together, always united. Those two things are essential. And so those, are, those things, that's what we need to do to get to heaven. Now one final point about salvation that's important is that we can lose our salvation. As I mentioned earlier, not every Christian will believe this, but the church tells us that Scripture tells us this, and God has revealed it to us, that we can lose our salvation. We can be in grace, in a state of grace, cooperating, having faith, doing good works, and then we can do something that will lose that, and that's a mortal sin. So we can sin grievously, gravely, seriously, and reject that love and reject that grace. And when we do that, we can lose grace. And we can lose that grace from our soul. And so just some scripture evidence of that. So the first example I'm going to give you is actually one that people who are not Catholic may say. Some of the Protestants. They'll say in John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know, I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall ne- never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. And so they say, well, Jesus tells us, I'm one of his sheep. I know him and I follow him. I'm in his hand. No one can snatch me out. But the argument that I would give them is, but it doesn't say that you can't choose to leave. It just says no one will take you out because that's true. No one can force you out of Jesus' hand. Once you're in, in grace and once you're believing in Jesus, no one can take you out. But I can choose to leave because I can sin. I can say, you know what, God, I reject your love. I loved you and you loved me for a time, but I reject it now. So you can still leave. Um, in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, it'll say the same thing, similar. It'll say, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And it'll tell us, it'll list the angels and the powers and the authorities and death. It'll list all these things, but it never lists sin. Because, it's tr- because sin can is the one thing that will separate us from God if we sin. If we sin mortally and gravely. So sin can se- separate us. And so we can look at scripture and see that. Let's see, let's do um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Paul is talking about how, like an athlete, we gotta, we got to work when we want to be a, be a competitor in a race. we got to beat our body, we got to train, we got to work hard. And so he tells them that he's running a race to win. And he talks about how he wants to win an imperishable crown, meaning eternal life, heaven. He wants to win this prize of heaven. But he tells them, but I have to be careful so that I am not disqualified. Because Paul knows there is still this chance he can be disqualified and not be able to earn, not be able to be rewarded heaven if he were to commit a mortal sin. So that was 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, so just the next chapter over, Paul tells the Corinthians, Therefore, whoever thinks he is standing secure should take care not to fall. So he tells them, be cautious. And he's telling them, don't be presumptuous. Don't just assume you're getting heaven and then become lukewarm or lazy or slothful. Be careful because you could fall. You could fall away. In 1 Tim- Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 to 19, Paul tells Timothy to keep fighting a good fight. Have faith, have a good conscience. And he tells them that some have rejected their conscience and have made a shipwreck of their faith. So they had faith, but now they've made a shipwreck of it. And they've just basically fallen away. Um, Now they have fallen away from grace. They're no longer in that state where they're able to have faith and do good works. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 to 19. Let's see. So I'm almost done. We'll do one or two more maybe. Um... Before I do the big one, let me just show you Luke chapter 8, verse 13. This is the the common parable of the sower and the seed. Whenever Jesus talks about how He's going to sow the seed and it'll land on different types of soil. It'll land on the rocky soil um, or in the thorns. But in one particular area, He says that some of the seed will land on the rock. So let's see what happens to the seed that lands on the rock. And so he tells them that the sower went, went and sowed a seed. This is Luke chapter 8. And some of it fell on the path where the birds of the air took it up. Some fell on the rock and it grew up but then withered away because it had no moisture. Some of it fell among the thorns and it was choked. And then some was on good soil. So if you look down to verse 13, Jesus explains what these different things mean. And in verse 13, he tells us about the seed on the rock. And he says, in this, the ones who are on the rock... Or meaning the believers, the believers on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but they have no root. So they believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. So it tells us we can believe. We can be a part of um, the faith. We can have it, it'll it'll have fruit. It'll be a it'll produce its little. The seed will grow, and so we'll have this faith, but then we'll fall away in temptation. So you can fall away, and. I'm not going to go through this one, but 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 to 22 has another very good example of falling away. Um, John 15, and then Romans 11, verse 22, also have this idea of being cut off, falling away. You can be a part of Jesus the vine, but then you can be cut off because of what you do. But the most important one is Luke 15, so the prodigal son. Um, so to me, this is a very important uh, parable because it's showing us something about our faith and about our relationship with God. So if you remember that, the, the story with the prodigal son, you have the father with his two sons. And one of his sons wants his inheritance. He goes, Father, I want my inheritance. And so he, the father gives it to him. And then what does the son do? He goes off, and what does he do with that inheritance? Squanders it. Squanders it. And it tells us he wasted on wild living and prostitutes, and he just squanders that inheritance he had been given. And so then, he, then the prodigal, prodigal son realizes, Wow, look what I've done. And he realizes what, what trouble he got himself into and how he, he squandered his father's inheritance. And so he repents and he's really sorry. So he goes back to his father. And then what does his father do? His father welcomes him back with open arms and receives him back into the family. There's a lot of different important points about that parable. We're just going to focus on a few things. So the son at the beginning, he was a part of the family. So we'll have a little house here. So he was a part of the family. He had the father, the son. He was a part of his family. This is like us when we enter God's family at baptism. So we enter his family. We receive our inheritance. Well, we're going to be promised our inheritance as heaven. We haven't received it yet because we're not saved, but we're promised our inheritance. So we're in the family. So if someone receives that grace in the family, but then decides, you know what, I'm going to go just squander it. I'm not going to cooperate with grace. I'm going to live how I want to live. I'm not going to live how my father wants me to live. I'm going to go be the prodigal son. Just live how I want. We have now left the family. But if we've left the family and now we're no longer cooperating with grace and we realize our mistakes and our error, we can repent and say, wow, look what I've done. I'm very sorry. I love God. I want to turn my life around and go back and repent. If we do that, God will welcome us back into the family. 
Now, some people will say, well, we, were all, we never left. We were always a part of the family. We never was, were disowned by our father. Just because we left, you know, sometimes kids can go be wild. We still were a part of God's family. We were never separated. But if you look at verses 24 and 32... In this parable, it actually tells us the state of how this son was after he had left. So whenever the son goes back to the father, and the father welcomes him back, how does the father describe his son and how his son was to him when he left? He says, My son was dead to me, but is now alive again. My son was lost and is found. And he'll repeat that in verse 32. He was dead, and now he's alive again. This is how God looks at us. We, he gives us this great gift to be a part of His family, gives us this grace. So as long as we're cooperating it, we're, we're part of God's family. But we can choose to, to co- not cooperate and to leave if we sin. And so when we do sin, we're no longer part of that family. We're, in a sense, dead because we don't have grace in our soul. But if we repent and come back to the Father, just like the prodigal son's father says, he was dead, but now he is alive again. So now he welcomes us back. We can go to the sacraments, sacrament of confession, receive that grace back into our soul, and once again be united to God. And so we have this sense throughout Scripture that you can have grace and then lose it, but God loves us so much that He offers us the sacrament of confession to be able to restore that grace in our soul once again. So I'm just going to end in this. St. Augustine says, God created us without us, but He did not will to save us without us. So He created us without us, and He hopes that we'll love Him and be in heaven with Him, but He's not going to let us just, He's not going to force us. He's going to offer us that gift of grace so we can cooperate with it or not. So God's responsible for our salvation solely, He offers us that grace freely, but we need to participate. And so we can say that salvation. Salvation is not God and me. We can, a better way to say it is God in me. And this is why St. Paul in Galatians 2, chapter 20, a beautiful line, Galatians 2, chapter, chapter 20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And that's how we're called to live. We have this grace within us, and when we cooperate, it's God in me, working in me, to help transform me, purify me, make me perfect and pure, so that I can reach final salvation. If I persevere and stay in that grace, and continually strive every day for holiness, every day to cooperate more and more, and being cautious so that I don't fall into mortal sin and persevere in that grace, then I can end up in the end um, in heaven because I'll have that grace that empowers me, enables me, gives me that supernatural power to, to be able to be in heaven. All right. So what questions do you have? Questions? Yes, ma'am. Why exactly is mortal sin? And where does it mortal sin. Okay, so mortal sin, I'm pretty sure you'll have a, another talk, but we can, I can definitely uh, talk about it real briefly. So you can, so in Scripture, there is one passage that should, suggests mortal sin. It's John, 1 John chapter 5. And 1 John chapter 5, it suggests this idea of mortal sin. Because John will say, let me find it. John, 1 John chapter 5, verses like 16 and 17. And John is talking about different things to the Christian people. And he talks about, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, which is not a deadly sin, it's okay to pray for him. So he says, There is sin which is deadly. In verse 17, All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin which is not deadly. So mortal sin, mortal, that word mortal means deadly so mortal means deadly, like a mortal wound. is a wound that's going to kill you. So deadly. The other type of sin we talk about is venial. And venial means lesser, but it really, we have to be careful because we don't want to look at it as, oh, it's nothing, let's blow it off. It's still serious. We're injuring our relationship. But mortal sin cuts us off. 
from God. And so when 1 John 5, verse 17 says, all wrongdoing is sin, because if you disobey God, if you break one of the commandments, if you um, aren't living the Beatitudes, if you're you know, doing different things that you know are not what God wants you to do, all wrongdoing is sin. But there is some sin that is deadly and some sin that is not deadly. And so, again, we can go back to this little picture. So when we're baptized, we're filled with grace. Venial sin, I'll give it a jaggedy line, because it wounds our relationship but does not destroy it. We still have grace. We don't lose grace. But our relationship is, is, is wounded. It affects our relationship with God because we have still sinned. We have still chosen something that God would not have desired us to do. Um, mortal sin cuts us off totally. So we may have had grace. Now we've lost it totally because it's something that cuts our relationship off. And a mortal sin is going to be, it has to meet three things to be mortal. That's right. I heard someone say grave matter. Do you all know the rest? A grave matter, which means it's something very serious. So if you look at some of the Ten Commandments, that's going to help show you grave matter. Also, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he lists, he says, these things you will not inherit the kingdom of God if you do these things. So he lists, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and it's one of the verses there. And so he's going to list adultery, idolatry, immoral, immoral behavior. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So it's going to be around verse 9, verse 10. And he's going to say, These things you will not inherit the kingdom of God if you do these. Um, so 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 10. You can also look at the Ten Commandments. You can look at the Beatitudes. You can also look in the Catechism if you're curious as to what is a mortal sin, but there's three things. It has to be grave matter. Full knowledge and awareness. That's right. You have to know that it's serious. It's serious. You know it's serious. And you do it anyway. And you do it anyway. So consent. So free consent. <clears throat> so I'll put free. You have to be freely consenting. No one can force you to do it. You can't have a gun to your head being forced. So you ha- it's serious, so it's grave matter. You know it's serious, and you do it anyway. Um, there's a lot of different examples, um, but I, adult, adultery is, is an important one. Paul mentions it m- many times, as in the Ten Commandments. Um, missing, not going to Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation, um, that, that would fall into a serious matter. Um, and so if you, it's serious, and if you know it's serious, and you just don't have a good reason, you just don't go to Mass, that would be a mortal sin, um, if you don't have a serious reason. Uh, p- participating in abortion in some way. Stealing, depend- definitely. Um, so if you look at the Ten Commandments, those are going to give you some ideas. You can look at a lot of different examination of conscience, conscience sheets. Not everything on there is going to be mortal, but it, it potentially could be. So you want to talk to the priest and kind of help help you to kind of examine your conscience about it. But a mortal sin is going to cut you off from your relationship with God because it's serious, you know it is, and you're doing it anyways, even though you know that God loves you and asks you not to do this. So you're basically rejecting His love by doing your own thing. So you're rejecting that grace by doing that. So mortal and venial sins, and so a mortal sin is going to cut off that relationship. And so a mortal sin, if you've already been baptized, and then you commit a mortal sin, you must go to the sacrament of confession uh, before, before you can receive the Eucharist, before you, you want to go as soon as you possibly can, because you don't want to die in a state of mortal sin. Mm-hmm. How can you have to go to the priest? Why can't you just talk to God? Talk to God. Okay. So why can't you talk to God? I know they're going to have these, these talks too um, as the year goes on, but because Scripture tells us, because God, Jesus established it so that you would have the sacrament of confession, so Jesus in a couple different places, um, Matthew chapter 9, verse 8 is an important one to look at, and John chapter 20, verses 22 to 23. So in these... In Matthew chapter 9, verse 8, it's talking about Jesus forgiving sins. And then Matthew says, And he gave this authority to men, plural. And then in John chapter 20, Jesus will breathe on the apostles and give them the power to forgive sins. He goes, Whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you retain, not don't forgive, are retained. And then also like in Matthew 18, 18, he'll give them that same power to, get, to forgive sins or not. And so he only gives it to the apostles... And then over time, they're going to bless, ordain other men 
to pass that on. So you have Jesus. He'll give his authority to forgive sins to the 12 apostles. And then they'll go from place to place laying hands on men who they'll call bishops. And the bishops will, that power will be transferred to them. And so the bishops, when the church gets large enough, will need priests to help. And so they'll also give that authority to the priests. Now, it's not something that deacons will have or the lay people. We can pray to God for forgiveness of venial sins, the venial sins that are lesser. But because a mortal sin cuts us off from God, we've got to do something to restore that. So because grace has cut us off, we must restore that. And the only way is to receive grace again is through the sacraments. And so you must go to the sacrament of confession. And so the scripture shows us Jesus gave that authority to his apostles who gave it to the bishops. And then Jesus tells us that this is something we need to do in order to restore that relationship. So it's just because of the severity of what's happened. So you've been in grace, now you've lost it. Now if it's just a venial sin, you can pray to God, you can um, pray, you can be repentant. Now you have to be sorry. You they have to confess your sins, and they need to have also some type of penance to do amends. So pr- corporal works of mercy or um, sacrifices or other prayers you'll do to kind of have penance for that. But when they talk about the sacrament of confession, you'll go into that more. Um, but those are, at least, is a very quick discussion about it. Mm-hmm. Other questions? No? Did that help answer your questions, Ashley? Yeah? Okay. All right. Well, Eric probably has some things he wants to talk about. Thank you.